Welcome to Deal Us In, a podcast brought to you by McGuire Woods and Seven Mile Advisors. Deal Us In promotes the advancement of women in private equity and finance through conversations with women leaders and rising stars in the private equity and finance space. These conversations provide both insights and practical takeaways to inform your deal work and enhance the culture of your organization. If you're ready to drive the industry toward a more inclusive and diverse environment, then it's time to come to the table. So I'm super excited to be here today. I have Rebecca Elliott from North Star, and it's a pleasure to have you here today to talk about networking, because obviously it's something that you believe in personally, but obviously are very um, involved with from a professional aspect as well. So it's kind of interesting. I actually, I was thinking about it when I was prepping for this recording earlier. I met Rebecca the very first week I started with Seven Mile. There was actually a North Star event in Charlotte that week that I was attending with one of our partners. And I have very luckily been able to cross paths with her every January for the past three years since. So I think the best way to start things off today is Rebecca, if you don't want mind just walking us through who you are, who North Star is, and then just like a quick overview of, you know, what the heavy hitters events are and what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah. So thanks for having me. This is, you now I remember when I, I first met you, it was very exciting because I've known Trip for years and we were super excited when he said he had someone new in his team. And, you know, it's been really great getting to know you over the years. So I've been with North Star 10 years last September. And what we do is we host private equity and investment bank networking events. So what we do is we create meetings between the bankers and the private equity firms to facilitate easy networking that's not intimidating. You don't have to make your own schedule. So you get a wide array of connectivity and FaceTime with people in an easy, relaxed setting. And we typically do these in the major cities. So we have like Charlotte, New York, LA, Denver. And we just take it, you know, wherever the banks are, we basically bring 32 private equity firms to a city and create those meetings and templates. And then we have our dinners and cocktail receptions. So it's been really exciting over the last 10 years to build the company and create more events and see how that helps the different attendees and the deals they get done. And also like the long lasting relationships we help build has been really great to see. And you see your work pay off in those different ways. Yeah, I have definitely learned that from attending the events. You know, I've been doing it for three years now and I feel like I'm still the newbie because of a lot of the relationships that have been (laughs) built way before that. So the topic of conversation today, this is actually the first episode in a two-part series that we're going to be doing on networking and really the value of networking to women. And I think this is such an important topic and it's something that's near and dear to my heart, obviously being in a marketing and a business development position, because in our industry and private equity, finance, investment banking, there's a lot of times that as a woman, you are either the only woman in the room or you're one of very few women in the room. So I think naturally women find networking a little bit more difficult than men. And it's just amplified in these settings because you're not seeing yourself reflected in the crowd around you. And I think even looking at the heavy hitters event that I attended this week with Northstar, I was looking through the attendee list and out of 12 investment banks, I was the only woman registered. To participate. So even though we're starting to see a lot more women around m and especially around some of the service providers, so I'm seeing way more women represented with the attorneys and the accountants and even on the private equity side. But with investment banks, I'm still not seeing myself reflected in a lot of the other banks that I am coming across at a lot of these events. So it does just kind of add an additional eek factor, for lack of a better word, going into some of these networking events because it just feels that much more intimidating. So let's start today's conversation by talking about kind of formal networking. I think when people think about networking, there's obviously two different kinds. There's the formal networking where you're going there with a purpose and there's certain meetings lined up. For example, you know, ACG events that people are attending or the heavy hitter events. And then there's the informal networking. So let's start off, like I said, with the formal networking side of things. 
And I think one of the issues that I've experienced myself or with other women is the wanting to leave the transactional nature of these events kind of as the elephant in the room, whereas a lot of our male counterparts really attack that head on of, hey, what can I do for you and what can you do for me? So what would you say to women who are kind of struggling with going into these events and being okay that, you know, ultimately the outcome of this event is new business? Yeah. So women going into a new meeting, I think we focus a lot more on building rapport. And when you're limited to like a 30 minute meeting or a 15 minute meeting, you have to quickly build rapport and move on to the actual meat of the topic. Why are you there? Why are you meeting with this person? And what can you bring to the table for them? As well as how do you get them to show you new deals and also find out about them? So you're in this huge time crunch. So you can't focus too much on, okay, how do I get them to like me? And you know, let me find out everything about their background and their, you know, where they went to college, their family. So you have to find easy, quick ways to build rapport and then move right into those deals and move right into why you're there, the purpose of it. So I would recommend people don't get too caught up in trying to get people to talk about personal details and their backgrounds because you are limited in time. And if you walk away from that 30-minute meeting with only knowing their kids' names, that's that's beneficial, but it also limits you if the meeting after you, they're talking about new deals and exciting transactions they've been doing. So you don't want to put yourself on too much of a leash when you're talking about work and business. Yeah. And I think going into those meetings as well, there's a lot of women that are kind of apprehensive because they say, oh, well, I'm not a networker. I'm, I'm not a born networker. What would you say to that? Because I know you felt similar that you weren't a born networker, but that doesn't mean that you can't become a networker. Yes. So I grew up, you know, I was homeschooled and then I went to a very, very small high school and then on to college. I realized how sheltered and how shy I was. It was painful. I mean, even trying to have communications in the middle of class with other students was painful. So I knew I had to get myself out of that bubble. And I joined the sales program at my university. And I knew I had no business doing that, but I knew I had to. So I said, okay, I'm going to figure out how to network. I'm going to figure out how to sell. And I'm going to take on this new persona of confidence, someone who knows like how to network with someone, knows how to ask those questions. And, you know, I kind of took different mentor ideas of like, okay, I really respect this woman and how she networks. What are some key things I can take away from the interactions I notice, like what she does and how can I implement that? And so it's cliche, but almost like fake it till you make it of become that person you want to talk to at a networking event, be confident. And don't think about your shortcomings. Don't think about, you know, because we get in our heads so much about all the different things that like I'm boring or I stutter or I don't have anything to bring to this conversation. Take away all of those negative ideas and think more confidently, okay, this person needs to talk to someone and I have good ideas. So let's create a relationship and grow and networking out of it. So just fake it till you make it and really force yourself out of that bubble because very few people are born a true networker. The majority of us don't want to do it and we have to learn. And the best way is to practice and almost evaluate yourself after a networking event. You know, what went wrong? What went right? And how can I improve from that? And I think that's a big piece of the puzzle is, you know, struggling with imposter syndrome and feeling like, oh, I I don't belong here. I don't see me in this room. I don't belong here. I don't have anything to bring to the table. I think that's something that women struggle with a little bit more than men. But I do think it's something that happens across the board. And you have to remind yourself that you're not the only person in the room that feels that way. There's probably a huge percentage of people in the room 
that are also doing the same, fake it till you make it. And I think your point about putting kind of the hat on of somebody that you respect and saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to embody how they carry themselves in a room. I'm going to embody how they strike up conversations. And I think just as important is I've definitely come across very senior women in the industry. And I say, I don't want to come across that way in a conversation. That's not how I want to start. I felt like that was very aggressive or I, I felt like that wasn't the best way to approach somebody. So kind of like your point of grading yourself afterwards and saying, where can I improve? Well, where could I make tweaks to make this a better opportunity or a better interaction next time is also, you know, looking at the people around you and saying, this is where I think they could have improved. I need to remember that for myself, or this is where I think they exceeded. So yes, as cliche as it sounds, fake it till you make it a lot of times. If that'll get you into the room and get those conversations flowing, once you start talking, it becomes easier. The yeah. worst part is you'll walk in, you're maybe the only person from your firm there, and you got to start somewhere. That's always the hardest part. I think with these networking events that are obviously a little bit more tailored to creating one-on-one -on -one meetings, it's easier to start that conversation. But there's always the get together before or the coffee hour before and you're trying to figure out, okay, what the heck do I do in this room of people? Putting on that hat, going in confident, starting conversation and just understanding you are not the only person that is feeling awkward there. Yes. But one thing that was really beneficial from, you know, when I was in the sales program is we would do a lot of video recordings of ourselves doing pitches. It was so painful to watch because you start seeing those weird words you use or different gestures, but it was very helpful in seeing, okay, I look nervous on a camera and people are uncomfortable around someone who's nervous. So trying to practice on how to take away some of that anxiety because people really do feed off of your energy and Definitely fake it till you make it, but don't go so far outside of your comfort zone where you're changing your own identity because you still want to be sincere to who you are. So if you're a happy-go-lucky person, don't try to be a shark because it's going to yeah. come across very weird, but be a confident, happy-go-lucky person, you know? And so don't go too far off of the barometer of, of who you truly are. And if you do feel anxious, maybe take a recording. If you have a Zoom call, which is great these days, maybe record it and then review it to look at the different things you do that other people might be feeding off of. So moving on, I'll, I'll use it here, the art of the pivot. So we've all been stuck in those conversations where you know, okay, I only have 30 minutes and there's somewhere I really need to get to by the end of this conversation. I want to talk about these two deals I have in the market or I want to talk about their portfolio company that aligns with us really well but they're stuck talking about one of their new acquisitions that is very irrelevant to you. Or they're stuck talking about some new team members that you will likely not be interacting with. How do you suggest people work on the art of the pivot, as we were saying when we were talking about this earlier, to be sure that you are getting out of that meeting what you want to get out of it? There are some people that are so long-winded and you don't want to be rude. You don't want to interrupt. But if, if that direction is going somewhere that you, it's just not beneficial. What I would recommend is trying to find different questions from what they're currently saying, but find a way to like stretch that to a different topic. So if they're talking about this new deal that they're working on in Chicago and this is an industry you're not interested in, but Chicago can help you pivot off to a different topic of, oh, so yeah, I, I, I saw you at that one event in Chicago. But, you know, last time we talked, we weren't talking about that one deal of yours. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? So find any little stepping stone that you can take out and redirect them, but in a nice way where you're, you're not interrupting them, you're still getting them to talk. And you yep. still want them to communicate with you, but you need to find different ways to pull out of their current conversation to get to the conversation you really need to speak with them about. 
And I think that goes back to what we were saying earlier, being okay with that transactional nature and these formal networking scenarios. At the end of the day, you have somewhere you want to get with a lot of these companies. You really want to get to either key areas of overlap or for us, we're working in a couple new industry verticals that Seven Mile hasn't exactly been known for before. If it's a company where previously we didn't have overlap in those areas or we do now, I want to be sure that I'm able to bring up how we're working into those new verticals, deals we've done in those verticals, the industry heads. And I think sometimes, you know, coming into the conversation and being really prepped with the homework that you've done can help make that pivot a little bit easier because then you can use the, well, I was looking at your website prior to this meeting and I saw you guys just did an acquisition in space XYZ, or I saw that you just exited a company in the healthcare services space. You know, what was your thesis around that? Are you looking at making a new platform investment in that area? If so, what are the key company attributes you're looking for? Oh, by the way, we just brought on a new head of our healthcare practice. So I think as long as you know, you're not just being awkward about it or super aggressive, I think sometimes that can come across wrong. And unfortunately, it can come across more wrong as a woman, because I think you're expected to have a lot more empathy in these types of conversations. Yeah. But if you're able to kind of lead into it or make some presumptive statements that allow you to make that pivot. I think that makes it easier. But always, we're going to get to tips and tricks a little bit later here in a second. But I do think having done your homework is going to make it a lot easier because you can pivot with a statement or a question and not just have to make a vague pivot of, oh, well, what have you guys been doing in the IT services space? Because that just kind of seems like a weak segue into an opportunistic area you're trying to talk about. Some of the most powerful networkers I know, they do their homework and they know what they want to talk about with you. And so if you're in a meeting with someone who's not quite sure what exactly they're there for and they're talking about the wrong topic, you doing your the homework for the both of you is really instrumental for that conversation and it helps both parties out. So let's go ahead and get right into it. I think what we want to be sure today is that we're leaving people with something that's helpful. So you and I kind of put together a list of tips and tricks just that we had gathered over the years that we thought would be really great to talk about here. And one of them was one you just mentioned was doing your homework and creating a to-do list. So why don't you kind of expand on that a little bit more? Let's take an example of, okay, I'm going to this event and I'm given the attendee list ahead of time. And there are certain people that I want to talk to. I know it's going to be awkward just to like show up and stick my hand out and say, hi, you know, I'm Rebecca. Well, what do I do after I, I shake their hand and say, I'm Rebecca? Well. Doing homework, we are living in such a beautiful world of digital information. You can find out so much about anyone at an event through LinkedIn, through their website. You can find out where they went to college, how long they've been working at that firm, where they were before. And all of that information is instruments for you to get to know them more, but it gives you a good starting point. So I found out that you live in. Kansas City. I'm actually from Kansas City. Are you a Chiefs fan? And that starts building the rapport quickly. And then you can start to get to know them. But doing your homework about, okay, what is this person all about? What industries have they worked in? And where are some of the overlaps that I can bring in so that we can really hit the ground running with our, our conversation and building that rapport? So broken window theory, this was something I wanted to bring up just because I think the marketing professional in me is always super aware of this. And a lot of people think of it in terms of your marketing material. So you're putting together your private equity one pager or your sins or your teasers. And if people see there's one small thing wrong, they're going to question everything else that they come across. I think this is also really relevant for networking events as well. Because I know for me, if someone makes a tough or a rough first impression, I really remember that. And sometimes it's the items that can be deemed very unimportant that really stick with me. So for example, 
with a lot of these private equity investment banking networking events, you're generally expected to show up with your one pager. So your one page printed out of either deals you have in the market or investments you're wanting to make. And if you come to these events and I'm meeting with you at 4 p.m. and you've already run out of them, that's a sign that you didn't do all, all of your homework before this. You didn't know how many people you were meeting with to print out enough or you had forgotten to bring them. And I think another example, and it sounds very silly, but being sure you have enough business cards. This happens so frequently at events, especially if it's these longer three, four day long events. People are out of business cards. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard that of, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm out of business cards. And being prepared with these little small things is so important. A, because you want them to have your contact information. And B, because it's just a little small example that they're likely going to remember of how you came into a scenario unprepared. So if you couldn't even come to a networking event with enough business cards, or you're going to have errors on a financial model when they're doing a deal with you six months down the road. It sounds silly to think that people wouldn't make these inferences naturally, but if you really look at yourself, I know I would certainly make those inferences. So you have to assume that people would make it about you. And another thing we had talked about was just being dressed appropriately. So again, it sounds so silly, but what are some tips and tricks around dressing appropriately for some of these events that you would have for women? Because it's definitely tougher guys throw on a suit. Women, you kind of have to think through your day a little bit more. We have so many options and it, it's great, but it's also so unfair. But something I got into the habit of early on in my career, because, you know, I was coming into this world of, you know, private equity and I was brand new. I didn't know how to dress, how to make the best impression, but also how to come across appropriate. Like, how do I make these guys not uncomfortable talking to me? Because you hear a lot about you know, if you talk to guys, oh, it just, it's uncomfortable talking to her because of X, Y, Z. It could be the perfume. It could be like the clothes are too tight. So what I got into the habit of early on is either taking a photo of what I intend to wear and sending it to like guy friends. Like, is this at all like inappropriate? Like, what's your impression of this outfit? And really focusing more on, okay, get the impression of like more of a Kate Middleton where you yep. look nice <laughs> and you look classy, but you don't look inappropriate to the point where people don't want to approve because they don't want to seem talking to you and then give the impression that they're flirting. Because if you're dressed overly tight clothes, guys don't really want to talk to you because all their other networking partners are seeing them talk to you. And then they'll be like, oh, what was that about? You know, <laughs> like... So you really don't want to even bring that into the conversation. So make sure you're dressed appropriately. I can't emphasize enough, like no perfume. We (laughs) Perfume is so painful for guys. And you might love the perfume, but it's going to give someone a headache. It's guys don't want the perfume to rub off on them. We're talking earlier about shoes. Make sure you're comfortable as well. And walk around in your outfit, make sure it's it's comfortable so that you can go a full day in it and in your shoes. Just be comfortable, but also be confident because if you don't like how you look, you're also not going to bring your best self forward in that event. And again, it's one of those topics that sounds so silly to be discussing heels and in, in the realm of networking. But I think it's one of those items that as a woman, you do have to be aware of. If you're going from 8 a.m. and you know you're going to go all day in the event at 5 and then you're going to have a happy hour and a cocktail, you have to plan, okay, well, am I going to be the weak link at dinner tonight because I cannot walk in my shoes? And deciding, okay, do I need to either pack a pair of flats in the bottom of my purse or do I need to wear flats during the day and put heels on at night? Because I think we've all been out with those women, maybe even not in a professional setting, but you've been out with your friends at night and there's someone who is the weak link because they can't walk in their shoes. And you don't ever want to be that person in a professional setting. So I think we probably all have those like go-to shoes in our closet that look great, but we know we can survive the day in. Because I do think as women, you know, we do have to hold ourselves to a slightly different standard. And there is a certain expectation of what you're going to be wearing. So 
I think it's just one of those things you do have to put a little bit more forethought into it than you maybe would want to. And I think that also goes back to your point of being authentic to yourself. So I'm one of those people, I very rarely wear heels. I'm the kind of person that normally has on a pair of sneakers with a suit if I'm in the office. So I think you also have to be okay with, okay, yes, there's certain expectations and a lot of the events that I'm attending, that's probably not the most appropriate outfit and I wouldn't wear it. But if there are settings where that is okay, and that's what you're going to be comfortable with, and that's what you're going to be confident in, then just being okay with being yourself and going into the setting, putting your best foot forward with with whatever is going to make you feel most confident in that setting. Yes. And there's a quote from Marilyn Monroe where she says, a lady does not complain about her feet. You know, like yeah. it stuck with me because we've all heard women complain constantly that their feet hurt. That doesn't help in a conversation. That doesn't help in a networking environment because you're complaining about something that you did to yourself. So yeah. it's a bad impression to then complaining that your feet hurt in a networking environment. And then people, you know, it's like that broken window theory of why did you choose to wear shoes that are painful? And it just, it gives that impression that you weren't thoughtful that, and then that you're complaining and just, just be comfortable, but you know, confident. Yep. So I think kind of the last tip and trick we had here before kind of moving over to the informal networking piece of things was the go-to conversation starter. So I know we had both said, we always try to keep a little bit of like sports intel or sports pop culture in our back pocket to throw in. But what are some of the ways that you use those in conversations to kind of keep the ball rolling? I love looking at where people are from because the first thing I want to do in a networking environment is get that person to talk because that will help me get to know them more. And then I can feed off of what they're saying. So I'm going to be asking, okay, open-ended questions of, and this is from my sales background, but open-ended questions are going to start with if, how, when, what. It's not something they can answer the question with, with like a yes or no. So how long have you been in uh, New York? And then they have to give a real answer. Like, so how do you like living in New York? Or what made you move there? Ask those open-ended questions to get that person to talk. The closed-ended questions are more of like, didn't you like the inauguration parade or <laughs> whatever? That's like a huge no, because when you're bringing in politics yeah. <laughs> and you're giving them a yes or no question, you can't feed off of yes or no without creating another question. So really pack in those questions to do the work for you and get that person talking. The majority of people like talking about themselves and they know themselves more than anyone. So they want to, and they're comfortable with that topic. And so if you're asking about themselves, their background and how long they've been with the firm. And one of my favorite questions is what's in your history, what's been like the most interesting deal you've worked on? Because then you get to really see some excitement from those people because they get to talk about something they're passionate about. And if you can tap into a topic that they're passionate about, you're going to know that person so much better after that network than before. You know, so talk about something they're passionate about. And then for sure, you'll know what to talk to them about the next time you see them. And I think it goes without saying, stay away from religion, politics. Right now, I would say stay away from COVID, stay away from vaccines, anything in that area, because people have a lot of different opinions. And at the end of the day, your opinions about those topics are not going to serve you. Just stay away from it. I know it's easy when you're doing the small talk before and after to, oh, well, have you gotten your vaccine yet? Or, oh, how is the rollout? Or what are the COVID protocols in place in your city? And so often it quickly gets to somebody's very like unique opinion on the situation. And if it doesn't align, it's an issue. So I think, again, good rule of thumb is just stay away from those topics. There is a lot of other things to talk about. The Super Bowl is this weekend. Find anything, anything at all else. (laughs) Yeah, be cautious that 
when you are giving your opinion about something, you're giving a lot of insight into who you're talking to about your mind and and how you think through things. And if you're overly opinionated about something that is politically charged, they're not most likely they're not going to leave that conversation with a better impression of you, your mind. And you're, you're telling them about, okay, this is my strong opinion about this topic. It's making them uncomfortable, but then it most likely it makes them see that, okay, this person isn't really a critical thinker or this person really doesn't think through things. So you want to be careful about how you present that. And if at all possible, pivot the conversation away from politics or religion and anything that would be a hot button issue, just try to get away from it as soon as possible. Yeah. Just think of the friends meme. Pivot, pivot, pivot. Pivot, pivot. (laughs) Yes. So speaking of pivot, let's move over to informal networking. So if formal networking is tough, informal networking is just that much tougher. So when we're talking about informal networking, we're thinking about all of the events that are surrounding the formalized pieces. So if you have speed dating events during the day, maybe you're grabbing coffee with someone before or dinner and drinks with people after. And that kind of brings its own unique set of circumstances. So it kind of goes back just to the starting point of doing your homework before these events. So what are some of the ways that you suggest people try to think bigger than the actual event and be sure, okay, if I'm traveling to this city for a formal networking event, how do I maximize my informal like non-business hours around that? Yeah, I think the majority of people dread this kind of open format networking because it takes us back to school and our very insecure selves of, are people going to want to talk to me in this room? And do I have anything interesting to say? Bring some interesting things to say. Read some articles beforehand that you just have as like weapons in your back pocket. And don't be afraid to reach out to people before an informal networking. Say, hey, I, I saw that you're going to be attending this. I'd love to grab a quick drink to say hi. And that way you have a to-do. So if you're like me, it when things are so unformatted, you know, just open format, it's uncomfortable because you don't know exactly what to do. And a lot of us are type A personalities. So to get through this is make a to-do list of, okay, I need to talk to this person, this person, and I need to meet someone from this firm. But without making it too clinical, do your homework on them again and give yourself different topics to to bring up. And I think going back to that idea of giving yourself some homework before, I was talking to a colleague that is in a very similar position to myself, but at a law firm. And she kind of has these ideas or I guess tips and tricks that she gives her team going into these events of, okay, you're going to be booked from 10 to 3 today be sure you set three appointments outside of that time. And so a lot of times it's tough, or I would say it's pretty easy to say, okay, I'm going to answer emails before this event, or I'm going to get caught up on some other work items. But if you almost make it another job of setting these appointments and being really mindful about it, it's just another way of being sure that you're getting as much as you can out of these events. And I know it's It's different right now in the time of doing a lot of digital and virtual events. But I think if you think through when we're obviously going to go back to a more in-person type scenario, if you're flying somewhere, you don't want to waste any of your time while you're there. So be sure that you have a plan and you're not, like you said, there's a lot of free-form time around these events. Be sure that you know what you're going to utilize that time for. And be really mindful about it. I think we use our phone as a defensive, like a safety blanket. Mm -hmm. But when you walk into a room, and especially as a woman, because we have like a a huge double standard, when you walk into a room and you see a woman in the corner on her phone, you think she's very disinterested in what's going on. She's very unapproachable. And you might just be on your phone because you're uncomfortable and you don't know what else to do. But the impression to the room is that you don't want to be there. And 
you don't want to talk to people. So put your phone down, put the safety blanket away and, and find ways to communicate with people. So you're not giving that impression that you don't want to be there because that's the number one way to make people not want to talk to you. Yes. As you said, women are definitely held to a higher standard in the setting. So I think we're just going to go there and talk about this topic that I think a lot of women struggle with. And I don't think it's brought up as frequently of that higher standard in terms of, let's say, after hours networking. So I always say the importance of saying yes. When you're invited to these dinners or these drinks, it's easy to say no, especially if you've had a long day, especially if you know you're going to be the only woman there. The easiest thing would be to duck out of it. But if you miss that conversation and you miss that opportunity, at that point, you have no one to blame but yourself. So in those scenarios that everyone was bound to end up in of, okay, we had dinner that ended at eight, everybody's going out for drinks at a bar. How do you suggest women navigate that? It's a minefield. I mean, it just simply is. I think. There is, I wish I had learned this earlier, but the the power of the mocktail, because after hours, it's kind of like a privilege to be invited to the bar afterwards, because they're not just inviting anyone. They are inviting you because they they think, okay, you're going to be fun to be around. So you don't want to be a stickler and saying like, oh no, I'm not drinking because it's after 10 p.m. or But if you get a mocktail, it keeps you alert. It it will definitely save your morning. But it also makes people comfortable to be around you because they're not self-conscious about themselves drinking. So the beauty of mocktails and making friends with a bartender at that bar or at even a waiter, they're more than happy, I found, to just keep bringing you mocktails. And I've done it at so many dinners lately because. I feel more fresh in the morning and I wish I had learned this earlier in my career uh, that, you know, if you do a mocktail, you're still engaged and you can still get through dinner without being tipsy or drunk, but it saves your morning. And so you really can, you can keep a fresh mind. And then you also help navigate any minefields. Like if someone's starting to get inappropriate, If you have like more of a sober mind, you can navigate that a lot more carefully and a lot more fluidly than you were, you would be able to if you were tipsy or, you know, so if you're not intoxicated, it makes every judgment call from there on out easier to make. And just a word from the wise, sometimes you do have to tell the bartender what you're getting at so that they put it in the same glass and don't give you a normal drinking glass. Say, oh, I would like a vodka soda, hold the vodka, please make sure they're in on it with you. (laughs) Yeah. And like give them a wink and, you know, you can even say like, oh, I'm on a medicine. I can't drink on, or I have to work out in the morning or bartenders. They one, they won't even ask questions. They love the idea that someone is pulling a fast one over everyone by staying sober. So I've had waiters like continually bring me mocktails and they're like, like, this is your special drink with a wink, you know? (laughs) So don't be intimidated by that. And one thing I have done so many times, especially with if it's like a rowdy crowd after a dinner, if someone wants to do shots, oh, for the love of God, don't do shots. I always order Diet Coke. I'll take a shot, but then I'll spit the shot out in the Diet Coke. I know it sounds terribly gross, but it it helps me not make that person feel bad for taking a shot, but also yep. I can't take shots. Like I've never been able to take shots. I don't want to take shots at all. So how do I get out of that situation in the most graceful way possible? And you avoid the ridicule that way as well. Or oh. the like, oh, she's a fun killer. Oh, hundred percent. I've had like people chanting like, take this shot. Because if I, I've said like, oh no, I don't want a shot. And that you know, when you're with an after hours crew, that's usually not what they want to hear. So find a way to get rid of the shot. Yeah, it's so so easy to say, okay, well, I'm just going to remove myself from the situation. But if you think about it, at the end of the day, 
people like doing business with people they like. So it is really important to build a relationship beyond your business commonalities. And there's a finesse to it, certainly, especially as a woman. But I do think it's such an important piece of the networking equation that, like you said, it's a minefield. You do have to navigate it, but it's not something that you can avoid. You just can't or you shouldn't would be my suggestion. And I think, as you were saying, with the late night crowds or the rowdier crowds, again, we'll just kind of talk about the elephant in the room. I think a lot of women, especially if you're younger, maybe, or you're, you haven't figured out the whole mocktail thing, it's pretty easy to start a conversation with flirting. Oh, it's, yes. it's always the easiest, least path of resistance. Why would you say that's a terrible idea? Obviously, it's a terrible idea. But. Oh, gosh. It is, <laughs> it is like opening Pandora's box. And this is where if you can't talk to a guy without flirting then there's a deeper problem. But think about it this way. If you flirt with a guy that is drinking, and especially after hours, most likely he will be uncomfortable talking to you when he's sober. Because he'll be like, oh, I think she was flirting with me. I, I'm married. Most of these guys are married. So they'll be uncomfortable around you. So you're setting yourself up for future failure with that person by even opening that door. I'm blessed because I have two older brothers. So when I'm in those after hours situations, I treat guys like my brothers. And that means calling them on their crap, kind of like if they say something inappropriate, just be like, oh, that's, that's the dumbest thing I've heard. But, you know, don't put men up on a pedestal to the point where they think like, oh, she really likes me or, you know, I can get away with whatever I want with her. Be strong, be confident. But also don't let them push buttons and don't let them take a conversation down a path. Learn those red flags in a conversation where, okay, I think he's trying to take the conversation in a direction that's going to be very uncomfortable in five minutes. And this is where like, okay, let's think about what I've learned about this person over the last hour or two. I've learned that he's got two kids. Okay. As soon as he's being inappropriate or something's if it feels like the conversation's not going in a productive way. Oh, what are the ages of your kids, by the way? Or, you know, but don't be so overt about it, but try to slip it in where it's, it changes the conversation, but also you save face so you can talk to that person for years to come. Because if you're going to be in this industry, you want to have a good reputation for years and you don't want people to feel uncomfortable around you. And it's those little instances where they feel like they crossed a line, they are most likely not going to want to talk to you because they're ashamed of themselves. You don't ever want to be that girl. As, As bad as it sounds, I think we've all been around guys or men that we work with who have the next day pointed out, oh my God, that girl was so drunk last night. Or I think that girl was hitting on me last night. And it's not a girl. It is a professional woman in our business, but that's how they're referring to them behind their back. And those are yeah. situations that you can so easily avoid as long as you are being mindful about it. And I think a lot of us in this industry are in these business development positions and we're having these conversations and we're in these settings all the time. And when you're younger, I certainly remember it does seem like the easy way to get their attention. But long term, it is not going to be the best way to handle the situation. It's not going to be the best way to build long term relationships with that person or with that firm. And yes, middle market investment banking and M&A is large, but it's also very small. Um, And that's just something you have to constantly remind yourself of. And that's where like the numbers really come into play. So like you said earlier, you might be the only female banker out of 30. Well, you're already a lot more interesting to everyone there because you're the only female. So what you do after hours is going to have a greater weight and it's going to be like conversation gold. Don't be the comedic line for the next day because you know people... I've been at dinners like the next day. If a girl messes up at all, the guys are talking about it. I mean, because 
what to talk about. So don't be, you know, don't be the cautionary tale. It's unfair. I know it's unfair, especially for these, for younger women coming into the industry. It's very unfair, but it is just a reality. You cannot do exactly what the guys do. Yep. And Rebecca and I are here to say there is a fine line to be had. Trust me, you don't have to be the fun killer or the flirt. There is a huge area in between where you can enjoy yourself and build really strong relationships, even as the only woman in the room. So we're not saying this as a, oh, it's polarizing. You've got to go one way or the other. No, it's just learn, learn from everything that we have seen. That's kind of a good way to move into our wrap up here is I'm sure there's people that are listening to this saying, man, I need to get better at my networking. I need to work on this. What would you tell them? I think with situations like this, the best thing to do is to practice. Practice beating people. Put yourself in, in odd situations. But you don't have to go to a business networking event to practice networking. You could do it at the grocery store. You know, you could do it at the park. Just find ways to experiment with talking to strangers. And the more you practice, the more you get comfortable with it. The more you get comfortable with it, the faster you can build rapport with people and you start to realize what are things that work and what are things that just don't work with getting to know someone and building a conversation and relationship with them. So I would say practice. So I guess if I had to leave people with just some really clear, easy takeaways from myself today, it would be always wear lipstick. Always keep a black blazer in your car or at your desk because worst case scenario, a black blazer will dress you up and make you ready for any event that you weren't prepared for. Put yourself out there. If in doubt, stick your hand out and introduce yourself. Easiest way to start a conversation. And lastly, practice really does make perfect. Nobody was born being a networker. Nobody was born being a a professional relationship builder. The more you do it, the better you're going to become at it. And the last way we always wrap up these podcasts with DLS in is just to kind of reflect back and look at, okay, what advice would I give my 23-year-old self if I could go back and say, hey, these are some things you need to be aware of, or this is something you should know? This is something I think about so often because I was 22 when I started this job. So I was so young and naive. Like, what am I going to tell young Rebecca about how to navigate this male dominated world? And I would say, learn the art of an Irish goodbye. When you announce that you're leaving an event, that is, people are just going to tell you to stay. And then it's going to be awkward because then you really want to go home, but now you're in a weird situation. So don't say goodbye. If you want to leave a bar, just leave. But in a very coy way, learn the Irish goodbye. Nothing good happens after midnight. So I'd say stop drinking at 10 p.m. Just stop drinking. Get the mocktails because you're just setting your morning up for a lot of pain. And as you get more tired and you, you drink more, your just logic goes out the window and your judgment goes out the window. So just stick to mocktails. But one of the biggest things I wish I had done when I was younger was to reach out to the older women in the industry for advice and for mentorship, because they could have taught me these things that I had to learn the hard way. And by no means have I done anything perfect. I've made so many of these like blunders that I'm hopeful that younger women won't make because, you know, I'm trying to navigate this world done like the where oh, no one's talking to me. So let me flirt because I'm young and I don't know any better. I wish I had talked to women in the industry about their tips and tricks to build relationships with people in the industry without taking a part of your reputation in the process. And I think the saying that my mom always had is the only thing you take to the grave with you is your reputation. And I think that's always something to keep in mind in in any of these settings. But like Rebecca and I have been saying, please learn from us. So if there's anybody listening to this and you have questions or are looking for a mentor yourself, I will post our contact information 
in the show notes, please feel free to reach out to us. I know myself and many, many others in the industry are always willing to give our tales from the trenches or anything we can do to be helpful. Yes, it really is. I mean, it sometimes it's intimidating to talk to another woman, especially when you're asking advice. I know when I was younger, I was very intimidated by the women in the industry because they're confident. They mean business, but be a little vulnerable. Just put yourself out there and ask for mentorship. Most people, they find it very flattering and they want to help and they they see you as kind of like a proxy that like, okay, how can I make her life easier in areas where mine could have been easier? And when in doubt, just remind yourself that you belong in that room and don't ever doubt it. Yes. And, you know, learn a new skill, do something unique. Like I, I, I started taking up precision rifle shooting. One, it's fun. It's like a good coronavirus experiment, but it also gives me something to talk about. So find things that make yourself more interesting in a conversation. I can't talk about my dog on every conversation that I have. So <laughs> try to find yep. other topics that are intriguing that might bring other people, their life experiences out. Like if you go skiing or if you go hunting or golf, all of those help you build a conversation around people in a very real way. Perfect. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us on Deal Us In. This has been a really great conversation and I'm hopeful that people are able to take some really useful nuggets away from this. And like I said, I'll post our contact information if anyone has questions please let us know. Otherwise, be on the lookout for part two of this series that will be published probably just a few weeks behind this one. Thank you for joining us at the table for this episode of DLS In. If you have a recommendation for an inspiring interviewee, a question you'd like us to ask, or a topic you would like to hear covered, or if you'd like to tell us about women-focused initiatives in the field, please go to our website at www.dlsnpodcast.com. We look forward to hearing from you.